President, fellows and guests, many thanks for your kind invitation and to speak to you this evening. Um, as the President has said, uh, I'm a medievalist and I teach late medieval history at Durham. I was also the curator of um, the academic curator of the Magna Carta and the Changing Face Revolt exhibition, um, which was held in Durham between the 1st of June and the uh, 31st of August uh, of this year. And you can see a picture of me there, um, in or behind rather, uh, the 1216 Magna Carta, uh, which yeah, is kept uh, in Durham in the Cathedral uh, Archive. And I'm here tonight to talk to you um, about some of the ideas and the intellectual themes uh, behind uh, the exhibition. The Society uh, very generously uh, lent one of its objects, um, possibly, no, probably the most beautiful object that's on display in Durham, um, which is the Bosworth uh, Cross, um, shown here on the left hand side next to the genealogy of Edward IV and a rather large picture of Warwick, uh, the kingmaker, but certainly not dwarf in comparison. And there is a close-up of the Bosworth Cross. A crucifix thought to be carried um, at the head of the procession in the private masses uh, conducted for King Richard III. Such private devotions continue even, perhaps especially, at times of battle, and this explains the discovery of the cross near the site of Richard's defeat and death at Bosworth in 1485, which brought the Wars of the Roses to a conclusion. This year, um, the President has already uh, intimated this, that the, this year has seen um, uh, various exhibitions around the country to celebrate, to commemorate the 800th anniversary of the sealing of Magna Carta uh, by King John in 1215. Um, there have been uh, exhibitions um, at uh, Lincoln, Salisbury, here at the Society of Antiquities, organised by uh, Professor Stephen Church, author of Harry's book on King John, and of course the British Library. Basically, anywhere that's had an association with Magna Carta has organised uh, an exhibition. Um, and Durham is one of the Magna Carta towns one of the so-called Magna Carta texts. Durham has three uh, original texts of Magna Carta, those issued in 1216, 1225, and 1300. The three charters, and you can see here on the left-hand side, the 1216 uh, Magna Carta, um, are preserved, as I've said, in the archive of uh, Durham Cathedral. And Durham has the only surviving original text of Magna Carta from 1216. It also has, in the archive of the cathedral, a copy of the 1217 Forest Charter, which sought to restrict the Crown's exclusive rights over large parts of England, and which re-established wider access for hunting, grazing and fuel. From 1217, Magna Carta and the Forest Charter were reissued and after each reissue, most cathedrals seem to have kept the latest version and to have discarded copies that were no longer current. But Durham was and is different. The area between the rivers Tyne and Tees formed in the Middle Ages the centre of the Palatinate, uh, an area of independent jurisdiction that was ruled separately by the Bishop of Durham, separate, that is, from the rest of England. Um, but at the same time, of course, the bishop was, generally speaking, a royal appointment. And this ambiguous position that Durham occupied, I think, in the Middle Ages, that was independent and yet with a head who was essentially a royal appointment, made Durham, I think, particularly conscious of English legal custom and encouraged a remarkable tradition of record keeping. Thanks to Durham Cathedral, we were able to show the 1216 Magna Carta. So, at Durham, we wanted to commemorate um, the, 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 the anniversary of Magna Carta. We have three charters, three um, uh, issues of Magna Carta. The next question was what kind of exhibition would be managed at Durham? We couldn't compete 
with the resources and the budget at the British Library. I couldn't compete, certainly, with the expertise of Professor Stephen, uh, Stephen Church, an expert on Magna Carta and on King John. So what we wanted to do was to organise an exhibition that, um, that had a dis took, I think, quite a distinctive approach to Magna Carta. And we did this, and actually we did this kind of accidentally, in a way, um, but there's a quite strong or sharp contrast between the Durham exhibition and the British Library exhibition. The British Library exhibition, I'm sure you've all attended, ends with the 1215 Magna Carta. In the Durham exhibition, we started with our Magna Carta, the 1216 Magna Carta. I did this for several reasons. One is that I was kind of not an expert on Magna Carta itself, but I work, as the President has said, on, uh, uh, on protest, on dissent, uh, on revolt, and especially on notions of citizenship in uh, late medieval England. And what really interested me about Magna Carta was the circumstances of its production. For the Charter was forced upon the king um, and was a consequence uh, of rebellion. So this is uh, an image right at the beginning of the exhibition, the banners of the, the rebel the rebels who opposed uh, King John, the steel boy, Fitzwalter, the leader of the rebels there in front of you. And I think we signalled immediately to those who attended the exhibition the kinds of approach that we were going to take. And we provided this quotation from the leader of the radical social movement in the 17th century, uh, the leader of the diggers, Gerald and Stanley. Freedom is the man that will turn the world upside down. Therefore, no wonder he had. At the beginning of the exhibition, the two causes which, uh, which say, no man, no free man shall be imprisoned except by judgment rules of his peers by the law of the land, and to no one will the king sell or deny justice. These two causes in the 1215 Magna Carta are preserved in the 1216 Magna Carta. And you can see that we've highlighted the two clauses uh, in, uh, in that charter. At the same time, as historians have argued, uh, and quite rightly, that the charter itself was the law that the king could not break. So, in a sense, Magna Carta then uh, has been approached very much in terms of the history of that very important principle of government, um, the rule of law, and 800 years of the rule of law. But it seems to me that in, in, in both of these approaches, what is sometimes forgotten is that the text itself, or the 1215 Magna Carta, was the result of rebellion. A charter forced upon the king by a group of barons who took up arms against the king. And so what we wanted to do in the exhibition was to emphasise that Magna Carta is not just about law and the constitution, it is also about politics and conflict. It is, as we said in the exhibition, as much about the breaking as it is about the making of law. Of course, and I've, I've made this point already, that Magna Carta, the 1215 Magna Carta, was not the only Magna Carta. King John declared the 1215 Magna Carta illegal, war started again, and then when the king died in 1216, a new charter was issued, a slightly revised version of Magna Carta, in the name of Henry III, and it's that charter that, that we have in Durham. One of the points that we tried to make in the exhibition, and I think it's quite come across very well, is that the 1216 Charter is arguably more important than the 1215 Charter. Without the 1216 Charter, 1215 might have been forgotten because the Charter probably was cancelled in Nulls almost immediately. The 1216 Charter was issued again in 1217 and 1225, each time with slight changes. And so what happened with Magna Carta is that the Charter was adopted by the Crown it was appropriated uh, by authority. And in the process, the Crown tried to take the sting out of the Charter by making it its own. But the Crown never succeeded, or never quite succeeded in doing so. It seems to me there are two, two interesting points about Magna Carta and the nature of protest. Um, the first point is that while the rebels were waging war on the king, they saw their cause as just and legitimate. 
They used religious language to describe themselves and presented themselves, if you will, as crusaders. The rebel leader, Robert Fitzwalter, styled himself Marshal of the Army of God and Holy Church. Rebels have God on their side. It's generally kings who do, but in this case, the rebels have God on their side. So revolt, on, from one perspective, was an act of war, an illegal act, but from the perspective of the rebels, there was a legitimate act, um, and they claimed their own authority uh, with reference uh, to, uh, to the church and divine authority. They tried the rebels in 1215 to present their behaviour as legitimate, not unlawful. And this, it seems to me, is true of all forms of dissent and resistance and opposition. The need for justification and the desire to claim authority. And I'll come back to that point uh, in a moment. The second point about 1215 is that the rebels had a political programme, a manifesto. There had, I think, never before been a revolt like this in English history. The rebels had a project, a reform agenda. They drew up their own demands in a document that they published just before the king agreed to Magna Carta. This was the document known as the Articles of the Balance. The rebels sat down then and negotiated with King John. There are two points here. In waging war, the barons were no longer loyal subjects. They were self-evidently rebels, at least from the king's perspective. But equally, in making claims, in holding government to account, the rebel barons were acting uh, as, as citizens. They did not see themselves as mere subjects of the king or obedience to him. They were politically active, politically engaged, attacked corruption, demanded better government. They believed they had rights in particular the right to speak out against authority, to oppose a tyranny. And the exhibition picked up these two ideas and developed one about the nature of, uh, first of all, about the nature of protests, um, uh, the ideology um, and nature of justification of resistance to authority. Um, by that I mean the line between obedience uh, and disobedience, loyalty and the disloyalty. And secondly, the sense of citizenship that materialised in and gave rise to revolt. And the exhibition explored the line between uh, citizen and uh, rebel. The connection between these two points is that citizenship itself could be a set of ideas that could legitimate protest and resistance. Citizenship, if it is anything, is a language of rights. To organise an exhibition around uh, Magna Carta and to see Magna Carta through the lens of citizenship does not mean reducing the Charter to a statement about the enduring character and homogeneity of British values. In J.C. Holt's classic, uh, brilliant study of the Great Charter, uh, he wrote, the history of Magna Carta is the history not only of a document, but also of an argument. The purpose of the Durham exhibition was to show how this argument is a continuing and sometimes violent debate about the identity, rights, and responsibilities of the citizen. This argument was played out at different points in British history and in different ways in rebellion and other forms of resistance. In struggles over freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of assembly, and freedom of association. And crucially, we argued in the exhibition that this argument has not been settled. And we can hear right, debates today about privacy uh, and so on, the, the right to privacy. There has always been a thin line separating the rebel from the citizen. And in the main gallery, we did two things. In the main gallery of the exhibition, um, we, uh, we, we looked at the nature of resistance, the nature of rebellion, and the different senses, senses of citizenship that were manifest in conflict and protest. So in the main gallery, we, we organised around uh, five particular periods. Magna Carta, which you can see here. Secondly, the Wars of the Roses. Thirdly, the British Civil Wars of the 17th century. Fourth, the Glorious Revolution and the Jacobite Risings that followed in 1715 and 45. 
and then finally the Chartist movement of the middle decades of the 19th century. And in the second gallery, which you can see uh, here, we focus on the experiences of English Catholics immediately after the Reformation, when they were seen increasingly by the authorities as rebels and traitors. And we explored how English Catholics tried to retain their religious identity and yet remain citizens in post-Reformation England through public conformity but private dissent. And then finally, uh, in the, uh, the third and last gallery, uh, which was an interactive gallery, we moved the story into the 20th and 21st centuries um, to people left the, the second gallery, which you just see, which is full of beautiful objects of the 16th century, to be confronted by um, images of the police, here with riot gear, which is, I suppose, rather disconcerting. But the point we were trying to make here is a debate about, um, uh, is that protests and revolt um, uh, have continued to reflect and generate ideas about citizenship. And on the screens, the screens to the left and to the right here of these, um, the police, that showed uh, the suffragettes movement, images from the suffragettes movement and from the civil rights movement uh, in, uh, in America. And we encourage people, that we ask people, um, it, so if we want to go back, uh, we ask people if they would, um, so it's the, the, the uh, I've got to point to here, here on the, this board here, whether they had rights that they would protest for, for which of your rights as a citizen would you protest? And people responded very positively to this. We weren't trying to incite rebellion, we were not trying to encourage people to be rebellious, but we wanted people to think about the history of protest and the way in which the history of protest has shaped senses of citizenship, and to think about past struggles and current debates uh, about uh, citizenship. So I'm now just going to um, uh, add a bit more detail to these themes. Um, the first theme then is the nature of revolt, the nature of uh, resistance. The exhibition explored the question, who is or what makes a rebel? We argued in the exhibition that that boundary between rebellion and loyalty is a fluid one that moves because the nature of authority and therefore the limits of what is acceptable and unacceptable are never fixed. This mutability creates and shapes the identity of the rebel and the character of the rebellion. People who might not see themselves as natural rebels become rebels in the eyes of authority. When the English monarch in the, uh, became head of church and state uh, in the 16th century, the punitive insistence on religious and political conformity turned Catholics into rebels and traitors. Although resistance was occasionally public and collective in the form of over plots to overthrow the monarch, mostly it was hidden and domestic. Worship took place behind uh, closed doors, out of sight of those in authority. And you can see here that second gallery, um, which was an attempt to recreate the inside of a, uh, uh, a 16th century sort of Brexit, uh, of a Catholic uh, household. Covert religious practices, although a matter of individual uh, conscience, were evidence or can be seen as evidence of rebellious thoughts and can be considered an attack upon the state. Private dissent could have public consequences. Uh, and one of the things that we showed in the second gallery was a series of objects, often commonplace objects. I think my favourite actually is the one on the left uh, hand side here, which is a, it's a roof slate. Um, uh, that has been converted uh, into an altar, altar stone. I was interested in exploring the extent, the extent to which you can have rebellious objects, and those could be quite commonplace items, but they could become rebellious through the, the ideas and thoughts that people might attach uh, to them. The glorious revolution of 1688, the 1689 Bill of Rights, the 1701 Act of Settlement and Anglo-Scottish Union in 1707 helped to forge a British identity that defined citizenship in religious terms. It was now difficult to be Catholic and British. Jacobites, 
to run on those who felt alienated from the new confident at, um, state, British state. And I thought it was quite interesting in the exhibition to have an exhibition on Magna Carta and revolts and to place kind of Magna Carta alongside the Jacobite uprisings. So in the same space, and this is somewhat of an aside, but in the same space we had uh, revolts in 1215, which is very much against the absolute pretensions of, uh, of, of the monarch. And then in the late 17th, early 18th centuries, the Jacobite uprisings and the Jacobites uh, are very much believers in the divine rights of monarchy. And when we went, when we approached uh, one of the private lenders, uh, Dr. Richard Sharp, uh, to borrow some of his artifacts, some of his um, uh, um, uh, objects, some prints, some portraits of one of his Charlie, the old pretender, etc., snuff boxes, other things, he said, Are you sh really sure you want to show this stuff, uh, this Jacobite material, alongside Magna Carta? Aren't they kind of doing completely, they are they completely different things? But that, and the point of that was to explore that, diff, that changing nature of revolt and the different ideologies of uh, revolt. And how the Jacobites could find themselves very much uh, uh, fighting against the status quo as believers in divine monarchy. So, on the one hand, the nature of authority can shift and then people can come, uh, become uh, rebels. But what happened when authority was almost completely um, absent? This was a question that confronted the English political community in the 1450s and that led to the Wars of the Roses. Rather confusingly, I've shown an image here of um, 1381 and the Peasants' Revolt, but the key items here are really the three books that are beneath this image of the Peasants' Revolt. Henry VI, I'll talk about this in a moment. Henry VI was at best indecisive, at worst ineffectual, but someone had to rule. The nobility found themselves in the position of rebels. Rival factions had to fight not only to secure but to justify their claims. Military success, however, was not sufficient. The views of ordinary citizens had to be taken into uh, account. Yorkist leaders. Uh, between 1459 and 1461 in particular, although you can see evidence of this from uh, earlier in the decade, turned to a language of the common good to justify uh, and explain their opposition to the king. No collectively as the commons, ordinary citizens believed that they were entitled to speak publicly and to be heard and demanded a role in the political community. And their support was an important element and the legitimation of aristocratic opposition to the crown. And these three objects, these three uh, texts, were, um, uh, we have, uh, were manifestos written between 1459 and 61 in English, aimed at a public audience. So that use of English thought was particularly uh, interesting. But the issue of legitimacy has been an enduring feature of rebellion. In the British Civil Wars of the 17th century, and here we see, of course, Edward Cook, the great um, a common law lawyer of the 17th century, and opponents of the early Stuart's kings. In the 17th century, and again in the Chartist movement of the middle decades of the 19th century, Magna Carta became a touchstone for revolt, having acquired the status of a sacred ancient text that was believed to legitimise resistance. The past, or rather a memory of the past, was invoked to challenge the exercise of power in the present. And rebellion has its own lineage. By that I mean that the Chartists in the 19th century in presenting their six, point, their six demands, demanding uh, a representation for the working classes and uh, a, a greater political uh, rights, presented their demands in the form of a people's charter, the title obviously referred back to. The second theme of the exhibition was the connection between uh, citizenship uh, and, uh, and uh, resistance and revolt. Um, protest has a, an essential place in the history of citizenship, and that is because the, the concept of citizenship is and, has, is and always has been rather a contested set of ideas. 
There is not, and there never has been, a single definition. Is it about rights? Is it about liberties? Is it about privileges? Are those rights individual? Are they collective? Is it about responsibilities? Is it about duties? Do we define citizenship in terms of political engagement and popular activism? Or do we see it rather in terms of obedience and doing as one's told? Is it about passively accepting authority? Or is it about making demands and asserting rights? Henry Hunt, the 19th century radical politician who spoke at St. Peter's Fields in Manchester in 1819 in what became known as Peterloo Massacre, offered a defence of the right to protest when he stated that the practice of holding public meetings in the campaign for parliamentary reform was, and I quote, a constitutional duty. The Chartists asserted their right as citizens to assemble, speak freely, and petition. The authorities had a different understanding of citizenship. They saw it as more socially exclusive and preferred to think of the masses as subjects. The British government, along with local magistrates, tried to prevent the occupation of public space, which you can see here in the page 1848, and to restrict uh, freedom of speech. Citizenship, in the past as today, has always included some people and excluded others. The rules about who is or who is not a citizen have provoked debates both in the past uh, and uh, in the present. Ultimately, in the exhibition at Durham, we presented an argument that revolt is a consequence of shifting perceptions and contested definitions of citizenship. Citizenship has never been a fixed set of ideas or values. It can empower people to speak and act against authority, that sense of having rights. But it can also be used to close down spaces for dissent and resistance in the interest of good government. Citizenship can therefore extend and limit rights. It can be about responsibilities and freedoms. And the relationship between duties and liberties is open to competing and conflicting uh, interpretations. People make claims, they assert rights, they try to obtain rights and liberties from governments, but governments often reluctant to give them up. Sometimes governments infringe on people's rights in the name of order and stability and security, and this, of course, is why we have struggle and conflict. The exhibition ended here uh, by referring back to Magna Carta, and I think the significance of having it at the beginning of the exhibition, rather than the end, uh, uh, I hope, um, is now, uh, and was apparent for those who visited the exhibition. The struggle for political participation and representation has been an area of conflict historically. And the main focus of that gallery was really about political rights, about representation and participation. But why the debate about what makes a citizen, about human rights, about the whole language and ideology of rights, having rights, provoked resistance in the 20th century and continues to drive popular challenges to political regimes throughout the world. To start the exhibition with Magna Carta is to make the point that the rights of citizens were not secured by Magna Carta or indeed by the People's Charter of the 19th century. They remained something to be claimed for 